Hello and welcome to Poetry in Protest, part of Banned Books Week, which is the annual, annual celebration of the freedom to read. Uh, events at, at Banned Books Week are put on by a coalition of organisations dedicated to freedom of expression, including Index on Censorship. And I'm Kate Maltby, I am the Deputy Chair of Index on Censorship, and I'm really proud to be representing us at this event. Um, tonight's event is a, is a collaboration, though, between the British Library, between us at Index on Censorship, and between the Living Knowledge Network, which is itself a collaboration between national and public libraries, which brings exciting events, exhibitions, and experiences to local library users across the UK. Now, poetry is frequently used as a tool in protest movements to inspire, unite and mobilise support. From Black Lives Matter and the women's liberation movement to protest movements in Myanmar and Afghanistan, poetry holds the power to gather crowds during a rally or grab attention online. Poets can offer support and guidance in the most challenging, tragic or dangerous situations. And I'm particularly proud to be joined today by Mayan Marie's British poet, Coco Fett, and poet and scholar, Dr. Shoman Herdi, for a live poetry reading and a conversation about this relationship between power, poetry, and protest. What role does poetry play in protest movements? And can poetry be a form of protest in its own right? Now, this is going to consist of a two Q&As separately with each of our participants and a poetry reading of selected poetry that our um, guests today feel is important to them. So I'm going to start with Coco Fett. And I'm going to be honest, part of the reason we're starting with him is that he is going to have to leave the event um, before we reach the final section. Coco started publishing poems in Samizdat format at the Yangon Institute of Technology in the early 1990s. Um, and he has a long, um, a long personal history of interest and engagement with political protests in Myanmar. After a brush with the authorities in the December 1996 protests, he left Burma, as it was then, led an itinerant life in Asia, Europe and North America and moved back to Myanmar in 2017. He has published several collections of poems and translations in both Burmese and English. His poems have been translated into a dozen languages and are widely anthology, anthologized. He now lives in Norwich, UK, where of course there is a thriving poetry scene of its own. And Coco was featured in the latest edition of the Index on Censorship magazine where he translated poems by two fellow writers who have been murdered during the country's bloody coup. On his website, Coco calls himself a poet by choice and Burmese by chance. Now I'm going to move shortly into a Q and A with Coco, but I just wanted to let everyone who's here know um, that you can ask questions yourself with the question box at the bottom of your web page, or if you're watching on Facebook, you can put your question in the comments and they will get sent to me. Tonight's event also has automatic live captioning available. To turn these on, please click enable subtitles on the web page. Now, after we've heard from Coco, we're going to hear from Dr. Chaman Herdi. Um, who is an extraordinary combination of uh, academic critic and poet herself, known for her pioneering work on issues of gender and education in the Kurdistan region of Iraq and beyond. But that's just a taste of what you're getting in a bit. I want, I think you've heard plenty enough of me welcoming you along. And if it's okay, I'm going to move to Coco and ask uh, him to briefly introduce himself before we start on the discussion. Thank you, Kate, um, for your introduction, uh, which is almost complete, and I don't know <laughs> what else I can add to that uh, uh, personal biography of mine. Yes, I was quite active uh, in as a student activist uh, in Burma uh, in the 1990s, and also as a as a as a poet 
a semi-dress poet. We published illegal, you know, chapbooks books on the campus. So that's how I was, I like to say, poetized and polit politicized, politicized and poetized at the same time. So I, yeah, yeah. So this politics and poetry have been twin passions of mine for a long time. And I wanted to ask um, to start by talking about format, because of course, medium and message so often go together. Um, just if you could tell us a bit more about that experience of, you know, putting together um, bundles, as it were, and the kind of physical experience of passing poetry along. I'm, I'm imagining, I mean, you have to forgive me, I don't have the experience that you have, but I'm imagining, you know, a person to person kind of relationship to poetry. So you're extending a network, but there's an intimacy at each moment of the exchange. Uh, you mean as an underground poet or as a poet now? I, I was to go back to the chapbook experience. The oh, the chapbook experience. experience. Yes, yes. We were, yes, deliberately uh, trying to outdo or, you know, overcome the censorship, which was really a big deal uh, for those who wanted to uh, publish legally in Burma. So we just ignored the censorship regime and trying mm. to get our own, own books out about very small scale. Of course, we handed them, handed the, the books individually, you know, we, uh, to each, uh, some, some students on the campus and so on, very small scale. Uh, even the books are like, it can be hidden within another book, a bigger book. So they are small, they are like what you call pamphlets, not really chair books usually. So yeah, these types So of... you pretend you're handing an official, an, author an auth authorized book to somebody and within it, there's the dissident literature behind the cover. Uh, yes, we could just hide books anywhere, you know, if there's, yeah. Mm. So that's the idea. That's the idea of the whole, yeah, the, of semester uh, publications. I, I, they are never big. They are, they are small in size and they are easy to be uh, hidden, yeah. So we just handed them out. Did that mean that yeah. you, sorry, no, no, go yes. on, go on. Yeah, we just handed them out also in secret, not based. That's why I, I like to call it, you know, my poet, my poetic career was discreetly, discreetly launched. It was launched, but it has to be <laughs> discreet. So yeah, that way, yeah. And did you, did that mean that you knew every, you already had a personal relationship with everyone who, was reading your poetry or did you have to trust strangers? Would it be passed on then to another link in the chain and another so that there's an element of risk there? Yeah, that's a good question. We had our own network of you know, poets and students, uh, also even distributors who we trusted. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we just, on different campuses, we have someone representing us. They would just help us, yeah. Sell and did you ever get caught? Uh, no, uh, no, not really, no, never. But I was caught for another reason, wow. for the protests, yeah. not for poetry, yeah. Yes, no, I knew that. I know that you, mm. I know that you've uh, had a lot of trouble because, because of protest, physical protest. But yes. I'm just, I'm amazed by this story of the poetry that manages to stay beyond, below the radar. Um, because that, to me, that, um, that speaks of a real trust and good faith amongst the other people that no one ever yes. betrayed you. So I suppose um, the big question is why poetry? Why did you become a poet? And how is that related to the experience of having to evade the censor as opposed to different forms of artistic expression? Uh, why poetry? Because I think that's the easiest or maybe not necessarily the easiest, but that's what was available in a very, you know, uh, in a, in a, in a in a very impoverished society like Burma, if you chose to paint or if you chose to do any other thing in, in, in art, you would have to have you mm. know number of accessories like paintbrushes, paint and other things, right? But poetry, yeah. you don't even need paper and pen if you are a spoken word artist. So that's, that's I think, the, one of the main reasons why many people, uh, uh, people in, in, you know, in impoverished societies are really into, or even refugee camps, they are into poetry and they choose poetry as a means of expression. Yeah. And was there um, 
a spoken word tradition within your circle at the time? You've talked about chat books, um, but did you, is performance something that you also did for small and trusted communities? No, the performances were not really huge. Uh, no, we couldn't hold any, you know, gatherings that would be noticed. So usually the readings we made uh, were, we, we were uh, doing were really small, tightly knit community, basically of poets, and we read to one another. It's not a public event. It, they were never mm. public, yeah. Well, I, that, I'm fascinated by this, but I've um, asked all of the questions so far, which is a bit uh, selfish of me. So I'm going to turn to the audience and really invite you to uh, send as many of your questions as you can. But I want to start with Emma, who has asked uh, Coco, we have all been following the situation as it unfolds in Myanmar at present, obviously. How has the coup been portrayed in poetry and have there been risks about of speaking out about the situation right now? The coup has been portrayed in poetry uh, like a blow by blow account by you know, different poets on every single day. I actually am compiling a book of what I call protest a witness poetry and essays from Myanmar, uh, mm. basically out of 2021, you know, protests. So every day we could see some reaction in, in poetic form uh, against the coup. So there are several, several, you know, pieces of writing by, by poets and non-poets alike emerging on the internet every day. So I, we thought, uh, my co-editor is Brian Harmon, and we thought of preserving that in a more, you know, more durable format, which is a book and maybe an ebook as well, because these, these things on the social media, they will disappear sooner or later. So that's why we are trying this. Actually, tomorrow is the deadline. So yeah, and the book, we hope to uh, get it published by January next year. Well, in that case, I'm even more grateful that you're here with us yeah. as, some, as a very different type of writer myself. I know what it means for a writer to be the day before deadline, sharing his time with other people. So thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you said about um, the accessibility of poetry and the way yes. that even in refugee, you used the phrase refugee camps, yeah. and you were talking about a spoken word being something. Um, so I wondered, um, you've talked a bit about your experience in Myanmar, but I wondered if you've, you've had engagement with poets in other circumstances who um, have different refugee or dissident experiences from other parts of the world and what communalities or collaborations you found or, or what the difference is between you as a poet from Myanmar um, and you know, your collaborators from elsewhere. Yes, uh, for the current collection that we are doing, we have actually uh, invited some Rohingya poets from the camp, oh. Cox Bazaar oh. and you know, beyond. Uh, and we have had several, several uh, brilliant submissions and we are very happy about that. So the difference could be that um, uh, because of 2021 uh, coup and the protests and the carnage, that uh, we have so many, you know, the, the, the central, the people from central Obama and the people from the margin like Rohingya and the Kachin people, they now have very much you know, shared experiences. So the differences have been narrowed in the sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's less differences in terms of even poetical experiences. Yeah. So that, that I, that's one of the things that I want to, yeah, I, I noticed, yeah, yeah. Yes, well, Jennifer has a question that I think relates to that, which is, do you still write your own protest poetry, even though you live in England now? Now, I think you've sort of in some ways already answered that because you're still responding to, you're still responding to your heritage and to your history. But I think uh, we'd all like to hear sort of how your poetry has changed over the years and, and how it has changed with you settling here. Yes, I like to distinguish between protest poetry and witness poetry. Protest poetry to me implies, you know, implies a political agenda, a collective, a group think. And witness poetry is more or less subjective and me think 
and not not always having political agenda. Not that for, I, 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 I opposed, you know, to protest poetry, but in that sense, I think witness poetry is more inclusive term that also includes protest poetry. So yes, I keep writing poetry. I, I call it witness poetry rather than protest poetry because I, I don't have any political agenda. And I think I write for myself, not, not for any organization or any, yeah, any individual. That, that makes yeah. sense. Mm. That's great to hear. I know we're going to hear from you in a minute, um, not just your own poetry, but reading some poetry that speaks to you. But I wondered if there were people you recommended that we should go and read who you felt had particularly inspired you or in whose tradition you feel you're working, whether it's protest poetry or witness poetry. Yes. Uh, so many Burmese poets to, you know, to speak of. And I'm going to read uh, some of the poems by some of the poets that Burmese poets who inspired me most, and I translated it for this collection. So you will hear them, but yes, yeah, several of them. Uh, uh, in terms of protest poetry, and uh, in terms of living you know, their lives for poetry, I think both Kathy and Geza Wen, both of whom were killed uh, you know, for their dissent, they really inspired me for you know, being very true to their own, you know, own word and own, own poetry and own uh, belief, I would say. Yeah, they, they are, yeah. The, I call them my, my sad captains after a poem by, by uh, a British poet. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Tom Gunn, after you, a poem, poem by Tom Gunn, yeah. I call them Tom my Gan. sad captains, yeah. Okay, I should, I should go and look it up. Yeah, um, it's a very good poem as well, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Martin has asked, do you find there is a lack of political urgency or commitment in the British poetry scene? And he's even asked, does it all seem rather sedate in Norwich? Yes, it does all seem rather sedate, but it'll be more sedate in Finland or elsewhere. <laughs> so I wouldn't <laughs> complain. I mean, people are, you know, the, 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 even myself, we we are all paying attention to what was you know near and dear to us. We have our own our own concerns and daily you know we can be worried about everything every single minute or we our our living will be hell, right? So I can I used to think of that way like people are so sedate, indifferent, and so on. But now I don't. <laughs> I I think yeah, well yeah, that's the nature. I would say yeah. And Norwich does have a thriving poetry scene, doesn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And we have a yeah. national writing center. Yeah, national center for writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Luke asks, what came first, protesting or writing poetry? Writing is, I mean, as a poet, when you are in dissent or protest, uh, Writing is a form of protest. So they are, you know, always together. Writing as a form of protest. So what, what came first? I think writing, for me personally, I think, I think writing came first because I was writing kind of, you know, in, in, on, a, on the sly, right? Writing on the sly. Uh, writing, my writing, I don't want to really I don't want the authorities to know that I, and so on. So writing came first. I think awareness about freedom and writing came first before I think the real protests began, I would say, yeah, for me personally, yeah. Yes, I was wondering if there was a literary tradition in your own family. No, not in my relatives or families, immediate relatives, so on, yeah. No, I'm the so first you're the poet. first? Yeah. Yes, always disruptive to be the poet in a family. Yes. I think we have one last question, which is uh, a response to the, of course, to the overall theme. How vital is freedom of expression in our literature? And importantly, do you believe that our freedom of expression in literature is becoming more limited? Oh, it's, a, it's a question worth a million million pounds. Uh, um, what shall I say? Uh, 
freedom of expression is everything, okay? But that is, uh, that is, uh, uh, that is obvious. But how limited it has become in the current uh, global setting? I think uh, we are in a paradox where, you know, in, on social media, we are free and we could say anything we want or, or so on. But then again, that I think there are limits to what we can say again, or, you know, in some societies, even on social media, you know, and so on. So I cannot put it more sophisticated than that, but I think that this world is now a paradox where on one hand, there is freedom of expression and so on. But on the other hand, there's limit to what we can do, what we can say, and even self-censorship and so on. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so I, I have to think it, you know, think it, think it really hard to come to terms with this, yeah, question, I would say. I'm sorry, I cannot really answer that. Yes, very I well. appreciate yeah. it's a very, very broad. I yeah. was aware when I passed it on, it's a very broad question, um, mm. but central to what we're talking about today. Um, and I'm also aware that we have bombarded you with questions for quite a long time now, and I'm very grateful to you for answering so fully. Um, but I think it's time to move on to the poetry reading section of this and give you a little um, rest from thinking on your feet, but we're all very much looking forward to hearing you recite. So um, my understanding is that you're going to start um, with a poem by a colleague, uh, Residual Lives by Mi Chang Wai. But yes. I'll, after that, I will leave you to introduce any further poems that you feel you have time to share with us yourself. Yes, Mi Changwe, uh, she uh, was born in 1953 in Doha, Burma. Uh, uh, you know, she is a Mon poet. Uh, short, she is actually known for, for short stories, not usually a poet. But this poem uh, is about women in protest in Burma. And it's called Residual Lives, or literally it could be the lives that remain, can we residual lives? Come night in city arrives with a pair of peeping eyes through bamboo mesh walls. Baby cry. All those family voices are gone. Between the dome of the tent and roof of our homes, only the crows call over and over again. Moles, fingers, snitches, the land. Words that are news to me. Foe has no label written on his forehead, but he is close, very close. In the depth of the night, when all lies are out, everyone must hold their breath. First, the footsteps of the army boots, then the orders. Two from this house, three from that house. Pull them down, beat them up. Rabid dogs snatch our neighbors. The Delan, a finger whose mure flesh is infested with maggots, is there to help. Bullet out of the darkness is blind and will, it, will hit a random target. It will destroy everything on its path. At a corner of this wall, a most violent plot unfolds out of a tragic opera. Comes the next morning, a group of remaining women from the neighborhood takes to the streets to witness the truth. Their mouths will speak up, their hands will stretch. They will pawn their own lives for their husbands and sons who have fallen on that blood-stained asphalt road. By 8 p.m., with their residual voices, they will bang pots and pans in protest 
until they hear the footsteps and the finger again. Thus, Residual Lives by Mi Chan Wei is about a township at the outskirts of Yango, where you know, on the 14th of March alone, 49 people were killed uh, in the protests. Um, okay, next, I'm going to read a poem called Flying Thaya that I just translated. This poem is again about this township where you know the people began to fight back in self-defense because there was so much bloodshed. Flying Thaya written by Tissani. Flying Thaya up against the metropolitan Yangon. Flying Thaya is wilderness for a poetical dozens. This is where the Eavari Delta hobos, who didn't witness the wild wars, but pushed through the cyclone Nagis and the Enya Mongols, who had left their farms for factories, mingle. Myanmar's New England doesn't reek of butter. They don't need a five-star hotel here. There's miguet wet market for vegetables. The place is as plain as instant tea without cream. The durian husk is known for spikes. The township is known for hooligans. At times, it will wash its misdeeds down in labor protests. On the Laitaya special menu are slams and sweat beads, mega meals and moonshine stench, factory smoke and malays. Those squeamish about mud wouldn't serve food there. And yet, Angelina Jolie has been there. Aung San Suu Kyi has been there. In the spring revolution, women of this town get obscene at the senior general. Men brandish sticks and dars. Children and grown-ups come together. Repress us, we'll rise again. Touch us, we'll strike back. The curtain to the first defensive war is lifted. The ideology of the people who haven't got their nose into surplus value theory is we have nothing to lose ism. They spit it out like quid beetle. Had only a superior power had to prevail, David would have never beaten Goliath. A revolution without the precariat is a wingless bird. A poster reads, if I'm cut down, the man behind me will cut you down. Black flags have been raised on the side of righteousness. In this sept spring of endless legends, they will thrive like a flower of forests. Death is no stranger. If you daren't fall, you are no flower. Uh, do I have time for another piece? It's up to you. Okay. Then I will, I think, finish with a poem about my poor friend, Kathy, which I read for an event uh, recently, and it is also on YouTube uh, for Requiem for Justice uh, event. And this poem I wrote for Kathy, uh, a Burmese poet who was killed on the 8th of May. He was arrested on the, uh, he was arrested in the evening, in the afternoon of the 8th of May, and then his body was returned in the morning of the 9th of May. So he died within the 24 hours of arrest. And the poem is called The Day Kathy was tortured to death. And this poem is inspired by a song by Lou Reed, which is called The Day the President Was Assassinated, about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. But this 
this is my own, and this is called the day Kathy was tortured to death. The day Kathy was tortured to death, I dreamed I was the poet laureate of Nebido, the abode of generals. The generalis generalismo was a poet too. So was the generalismo's American cocker spaniel. But I just wanted to properly pay tribute to him um, at the end of that section um, to say how grateful I was that he was able to join us. Um, I know people, when people who live relatively privileged lives in Western countries say that we are humbled um, to listen to other people's poetry and experiences of dissent and exile and protest, that it often um, feels inadequate to the task, but that is how one feels. I think listening to Coco's, I mean, not just his witness, but his words. Um, and I will just remind everybody that, um, Coco is featured in the latest edition of Index on Censorship magazine. And I believe um, if you want to see those poems again, two of them are featured in the magazine where he's featured. I also would say that he is the co-editor and translator of the Penn award-winning poetry anthology, Bones Will Crow, 15 Contemporary Burmese Poets. So if you want to learn more, that is somewhere I would start. I would go to Bones Will Crow, 15 Contemporary Burmese poets. Okay, well, again, sorry about that. But hello to um, Dr. Choban Herdi. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Herdi, for your patience as well, waiting in the wings in the first section. Um, Dr. Herdi is uh, one of these people who's so accomplished, one doesn't quite know where to start with the bio. Um, but she is the author of critically acclaimed books across the fields of poetry, academia, and translation. Um, she's an educated Persian scholar known for pioneering work on issues of gender and education in the Kurdistan region of Iraq and beyond. After 26 years of exile, she returned home in 2014 to teach English and to initiate gender studies at the American University of Iraq, Sulaimani, where she also served as the English department chair in 2015 to 2016. Um, so those of us who have any experience of um, setting up, leading or watching other people lead academic departments in this country can just imagine the energy and organization that was required to do that um, at the American University of Iraq in the circumstances. Since 2010, poems from her first English collection, Life for Ups, has been studied by secondary school students in the UK as part of their English curriculum. Her second collection, Considering the Women, 2015, was given a recommendation by the Poetry Book Society and shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best Collection. And her translation of Sherko Becker's Butterfly Valley in 2018 won a Penn Translates Award. And I mean, I can go on. Uh, she studied at Oxford, London and Kent universities. She was awarded a postdoctoral scholarship from the Leverhulme Trust, which is in itself an amazing achievement. Those are brilliant awards. Um, but really, uh, Dr. Herdy, let's actually hear from you and not from me. And I wanted to start um, just by asking you, if listening to that conversation with Coco Fett, if there was anything that really jumped out of you that you felt you wanted to respond to. Yeah, I think I, I agree with Coco that poetry of witness is more encompassing than poetry of resistance, because many of us, um, even though we may be not central in the resistance, we are witnessing the resistance, we are upholding and supporting the resistance with our words. And um, I very much liked the way he described his, his journey from um, homeland and also to becoming a refugee poet and, and settling in Norwich and the difficulties of, you know, these reconciling these very two different worlds and finding your way as a poet in a new land. Um, so that obviously I, I was in a similar situation when I came to London in 93, I was in my late teens uh, and I was writing in my mother tongue then I started writing in English much later and at the time we were I mean I I feel um for Coco ending up in Norwich because I was in London which is much more multicultural 
and we were still struggling. And there were a group of us, uh, refugee and immigrant writers who had not been translated, who were struggling with cultural and linguistic barriers. And I am to this day and forever grateful to Jennifer Langer, uh, an English second language teacher who sort of went around the different communities trying to put together an anthology of refugee writers so she can teach those poems to her students. And she thought they would learn English better if they were reading poetry from their own country. As a result of that anthology, she established Exiled Writers Inc. And I was the first chair of that organization. She was and still is the director of that organization, which actually became a platform for many refugee writers. Uh, we had readings in the Poetry Cafe the first Monday of every month. And as a result of that, many British, um, sometimes first they were humanitarian workers or social workers who were interested in our work. Gradually, literary, literature lovers and poets also turned up. And through there, we got invited to you know, other conferences and readings. And some of us who still wrote in our mother tongues were translated into English and so on. So I, I identify with all of that and I, and I see how difficult it is, um, but also the possibilities that there are uh, wherever you're based, um, starting in a new land where you can speak loudly about all the issues that were suppressed at some moment in time. Yes. Um... And I wouldn't dream of disputing with you, London is more multicultural than Norwich um, and that that offers possibilities. But one of the things I found interesting listening to Coco is very selfishly from my own, my own minor academic research is on um, Elizabethan literature. And one of the things that's really important about Norwich back in, I mean, in 1578, when Elizabeth first goes to visit it, um, it is the center for the refugee community of Huguenots, mainly Dutch and uh, French Protestants. And it's, everyone talks about it. Everyone knows that Norwich is where, is, is, is a multilingual place and it's a multi-religious place and there's a lot of tension and not everyone is happy with it. But some of these, you know, some of these waves of, um, of exile and asylum and the, the politics that comes with it, um, well, they go they go back further in this country than we sometimes than we sometimes like to talk about. Um, but I'm some you know, fantastic poets in Norwich, you know, home to George Surtees, Moniza Alvi, uh, Helen Ivory, and many others, and the Creative Writing Program. It is a fantastic place to be. But I, I still think London is a bit more easier for, I mean, I think you'll find oh, many sure. members of the community in London. Um, when I was doing my research about refugee women and I was comparing London with Hull, because it was a new, uh, new city where after the dispersal system, the government was sending in refugees there. And there were no translators, no community centers, no, um, no support in a way, and that was, a much bigger struggle. But you're right. I mean, historically, many of these places, especially ports and border lines, uh, were much more open and diverse than they have become. And I suppose, so you came to London as a teenager with your with your family. Um, did you uh, start writing poetry as a teenager? And did you, did you write it in a range of languages even then? I, I had started writing already shortly stories and I thought I will become a short story writer or a novelist. I have always been toying with novel writing. I have written a novel which uh, I've never managed to publish yet. But so a poetry happened to me when I was in London. Um, I think I started toying with the idea when I was in Iran uh, and I read a lot of Persian literature then, po Persian poetry, modern poetry, which resonated with me because Kurdish poetry, a lot of classical Kurdish poetry is very grand by very famous men. It's patriotic, it's serious, or it's romance. Uh, and it wasn't about daily experiences. It wasn't about the things that mattered to me. So I, I think reading in Persian gave me that window of, oh, poetry could be about the things that mattered to me as well. Um, so I started writing things that were between poems and stories uh, in my late teens and started seriously writing poetry in my early 20s. Yes, and um, you're also the, the seventh and youngest child of um, a, a, another poet, Ahmed Herdi. And I, 
I mean, I, I imagine people are probably always bored of being asked about their famous relatives um, when they're here to talk about their own poetry. But uh, how did sort of coming from a literary family and the sort of inevitable tension between uh, kind of legacy and rebellion relate to the experience of being a, you know, an exiled poet, a poet who is working out your relationship with your history and your heritage, as well as your relationship with your parents, if I can ask something so broad and so personal. Sure. I mean, I, it's very interesting because lots of people say, oh, dad, famous poet and so on. But it's all of these things are quite relative. So when we came to England, when we came to London, my father became a refugee man in his 60s who didn't speak English. Nobody knew him. Um, he became he lost all his status, social status, um, struggled a lot uh, with depression and loneliness um, because he, he was considered one of the treasures, uh, you know, by many people and still is. And, and suddenly he was just, he felt that he had become a nobody in exile. So it, it was very difficult sort of dealing with that kind of contradictory situation where in one community, um, you know, op, you know, because many of his poems had been turned into very classic songs and everybody knows them. Everybody knows the lines from these songs. So it was completely different. But for me, I mean, my father was like, um, he was very much, uh, he wrote classical poetry and he struggled understanding modern poetry. And my first in Kurdish collection was published uh, in 1996 um, in Kurdish by a small diaspora publisher in Denmark. And it was, you know, it was free verse. Uh, there were no rhyme and meter and so on. Um, and I had quoted a Persian poem, which had Raimanita, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And he read the whole book and he said to me, the only poem in this book is that Persian poem because the others he didn't yeah. consider to be poetry. Whenever I tell people this, they think uh, it must've been traumatic, but no, to be honest, I, that was my dad and that's how his honesty. And I knew that that wasn't his type of thing and I never was hurt by it. But that's how it was. So we we were always struggling with what poetry is, you know. You know, he was like, "Oh, you, you what what is this? What do you just put sentences together and you have an image here and there, and you think this is a poem?" So we had completely different understandings of poetry. But of course, the fact that we had a lot of poetry and a lot of books in the house uh, was an important factor in my life. The fact that he recited a lot of poetry by heart, um, he was very he had a fantastic memory. He had memorized many verses, hundreds of them. And the fact that he always had a poem relevant to whatever situation we were in, and he would just come up with them. These, all of these things made poetry very accessible and um, made rhythm part of our lives. He was a very good storyteller. And I think that was probably another thing that really helped develop my imagination and my thirst for words and, and for stories. So he had this habit of cutting cutting a long story into small bits and every night he would read me or he would you know tell me a piece of it and, and keep me waiting until the next night and so all of these things are important I think um, we are a combination of many things aren't we I mean environment um, socialization our own efforts maybe a bit of genetics all of these factors play a role um, but and um, I have to confess one more thing. I, I always loved sciences. And in, at some stage in life, I was, I was thinking about studying sciences rather than philosophy, um, physics and maths, I loved them. But my sister became a doctor. And uh, when she went to study medicine, she had won a gold medal for a short story competition in Iran, she wrote in Persian. But then when she studied medicine, she had no time left for this. And she always said to me, do not study sciences if you want to continue writing. And I, I took her advice and I went more into words because I think that would have taken me to completely another track. Well, while we're talking about um, your particular, the particular relationship of language and your poetry, um, I have a question from Emma I, who says, I was deeply moved by your poem, Dispute Over a Mass Grave. Can you talk a bit about the process of writing the poem and the story behind that poem specifically? Sure, so this comes out of, this is one poem in a sequence called the Anfal. Uh, the Anfal was a genocide campaign by the Ba'ath government in Iraq against the Kurdish village population. Uh, it took place uh, between February and September, 1988. 
And so what I did after finishing my PhD, I did, uh, I got a scholarship from the Leverhulme Trust and I came home, did a lot of field work, uh, visiting the areas because there's six geographical areas on the borders of Iran and Turkey that were sort of destroyed during the campaign. And many people on these villages ended up in mass graves. There were um, more than 200 gas attacks uh, on this area and so on. Um, and there were deportations, uh, prisons, uh, separation of men from women and elderly from young. So I, I for my postdoc research, I, I studied or I, I wanted to understand women's experiences of the genocide campaign because uh, at the time there were many documentaries on the Kurdish satellite channels and many questions I had about what women experienced uh, in their own bodies, you know, uh, being in prison, being without demand, sexual harassment and so on, were not really answered in these documentaries. So I came back in search of answers for my own questions. And while I was doing a lot of field work, I would spend stretches of time in Kurdistan in villages here and there from the border of Turkey to the border of Iran. Um, these, you know, I mean, they were very traumatic survival stories. And I, um, every time they cried, I cried. And every story in a way became its own nightmare. I was doing okay when I was doing the field work in a way, but when I came back to Europe and had to sit down and listen to the stories and, and sort of analyze them, it became extremely traumatic and I felt very sick and I was unable to do much for about a year. But so while, while I was collecting the data, the voices of these women um, were so strong and sometimes sentences they said were like, you know, they already sounded like a line from a poem. So. I thought about this for a long time, writing a sequence of poem in their own voices, enwrapped by my voice as the researcher, and that's what the sequence does. So the, the researcher comes at the, as in the first poem, very naive and matter of fact, and thinking she knows it all, and asks the survivors to speak. And each survivor tells their own story, 11 of them. And at the end, the researcher comes in again, completely traumatized and, and uh, devastated and poisoned by this knowledge. So that poem is one of the poems, the story of some of those women who were continuously looking for closure because they kept saying that um, if you have a bare body you bury, um, you can be sure and you can grieve and move on. But when you don't have a body, when the body of your loved one is buried with hundreds of others in a desert, uh, you keep hoping that they may have survived and when there were opportunities of uncovering mass graves, there was always a lot of, that's my relative, or is it your relative? Um, because unfortunately it's too expensive to do DNA testing. So uncovering graves meant that they would just bring back loads of people and they know this lot are from that region, but nobody would get their own relative back. They wouldn't know who it was exactly and because they had no IDs on them, many of them. So that story is about two, po two women, that poem, two women arguing over the, um, the remains of a 14 year old son. Each of them wants it to be her son because each of them wants closure and wants to bury their son. And, and one of them says, no, you know, she's telling, she's not, it's, it's, it's this disagreement about the remains of a loved one. Like a reverse judgment of Solomon is what I'm, it's making me think of. Now um, we have, a lot of questions, sorry, my earplugs falling out. We have a lot of questions for you, which uh, I think is testament to the number of your admirers who we have with us, but we also are running out of time. So I'm going to ask um, a couple of questions at once, and then we're gonna move on to the poetry reading. Uh, Claire asks, and I think this is a key question, is poetry really an effective protest tool? Have you seen poetry make a difference to people's lives. Um, and I think combined with that, if I could also just put to you Marnie's question, as a poet who has a passion for social justice, do, how do you balance your need to fight for rights and the necessity to make a living? I think it makes a huge difference. Uh, and I'm not saying that simply because I'm a poet. Um, I know that in communities like mine, where there has been successive traumas and one after the other, um, there's a tendency to become numb uh, to events. And people are, it's, it's, it's a sort of, in a way, it's a survival strategy. Your brain sort of protects you from feeling all the horrible stuff. But when it becomes a permanent trait, and sometimes that happens, a survival mechanism becomes part of who you are. It's quite tragic because it means that people end up actually not feeling. And when they don't feel, they don't react. 
They don't resist, they don't fight back. And I think poetry is wonderful in making you feel that sadness that you should feel. It's wonderful in making you feel that outrage that you should feel in order to take action, simply because that apathy and numbness and getting on with your own life does not change anything. So in my own perspective, and I've seen this happen, I've seen poetry being read by myself or others and people starting to cry and people saying, you know, I try to avoid thinking about that, but tonight I had no choice. And I think it's very important sometimes not to have the choice and to think about that sadness and to contain it and to maybe that will be the energy to push you to do something. What was the second question? Well, um, to be honest, looking at the time, I think that's the perfect moment for us to ask you to move into your own poetry reading. Um, I will leave you to introduce that once you've settled yourself down at the right spot, but we've only got about five minutes left, so I will leave it in your hands. Super. I mean, um, I wanted to read a lot of poems, but I, I don't think I have time. Uh, maybe I will read just uh, one poem from the Anfal sequence that you mentioned, um, because um, this poem is called The Angry Survivor. And I think that's one thing that we don't realize. We keep saying to ourselves and to others as researchers and writers and poets that we try to amplify other people's voices. And sometimes other people that we're trying to speak to, they say that um, they feel they don't want to speak to us because they feel that their stories are being um, used, they're repeatedly used um, uh, for their story and, and their situation does not change. So this poem, is about a survivor that I met when I was doing my postdoc research about Anfal, and she nearly kicked me out of her house, and rightly so. I am fed up with, my, with documentations of my grief. Journalists asking me to sing a lullaby for my dead children to broadcast during commemorations. Government officials using my story as propaganda during elections. Women activists forcing me to talk about rape only to prove that women are oppressed. Researchers claiming to record history when all they do is pick my wounds. This is my story, not yours. Long after you turn off your recorder, I stay indoors and weep. Why don't people understand? I'm neither hero nor God. Cannot cannot stand the talk of forgiveness. For years, I went to every wake, wept at every man's funeral, kept asking why, then realized I will never understand. I just endure the days by planting cucumbers, which you interrupted, by believing in another world where there will be justice, by watching my remaining children as they sleep, Spare me your despair and understanding. You don't, you can't resurrect the dead, feed my hungry children, bring me respect. Take history with you and go. Don't come here again. I just don't want to know. I want to end with an uplifting poem because I think it's important to remember that uh, poetry, yes, can give voice to a lot of grief and a lot of sadness that sometimes we um, shy away from or shut away because we cannot process it, we cannot handle it. But poetry can also be very mischievous and it can laugh at those in power. So I, I'm going to read this poem called The Seventh Wedding Invitation. And it's um, in Kurdish, we have this saying, if a little girl is, um, you know, if she's clever or funny or she's cheeky, they say to her, you will marry seven times. Um, this is supposed to be a curse because it's supposed to mean that no man will put up with you. You're, so, you're going to be so difficult. And it's supposed to be a, a, a failure on your behalf. And I, I just wanted to sort of turn this around, uh, this idea of bad woman, reclaim it and celebrate it. Because in my view, if you manage to convince seven people to marry you, you must be special. So this is the seventh wedding invitation. Dear friends and family, I promise this will be my last wedding. If it doesn't work out, I'll just live with another man, no more pledges. 
So please come along to this final ceremony with a man who at the moment fills my eyes. Do not bring any more presents, please. Pura Shehla's nonstick pan is still in the box. Mama Hammer's gold ring has not been put on and the naughty laundry will be worn for this man. Since my ex was orthodox, he didn't last long. Do come along. I promise to wear something more sophisticated than a wedding dress. It's another chance to meet and talk about Amma's failure in bringing up her children, to shed light one more time on Leila's divorce and Nina's remarriage to her brother-in-law. We will have a fun night. I have told my new man so much about you, and it may be your last chance to meet him. With all my love, your little Lala. I think I, do I have poem for a tiny, tiny time for a tiny poem? If it's less than a minute or two minutes. Yeah, it's, it's a very short one called um, His Boots. And I wrote this when Saddam Hussein went into hiding after he was, um, after the Ba'ath government fell. And I just wanted, I sort of imagined this dictator changing it to an old man on the run. The old woman will always keep those boots. On the day when things were ending, she was leaning on her stick in disbelief when a car with black windows slowed down. She watched the back window open fast and there he was, the dictator, suddenly looking old and frail, dropping his military boots and replacing them with old men's shoes. Then the window closed and the car took off, leaving dust on the pair of boots, still warm and moist from his feet. I tried to humanize him a little bit that he was sweating. <laughs> well, isn't that part of the point of poetry? Um, that was deeply moving and beautiful and I will be going away and reading more. Um, I am sorry that we didn't get to ask everybody's questions, which like I say, I think only testifies to the popularity of the event. Um, we are running out of time and because this is a Zoom, I think the whole the whole screen will close any minute now. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to you, uh, Dr. Choman Hardy again, um, and a thank you in absentia to Coco Fett, who obviously left us quite abruptly. Um, we really appreciate everyone being here. Um, please let us know, audience, please let us know what you thought of the event with the feedback button. You can donate to the work of the British Library and the Living Knowledge Network on the British Library website. Those are the things I have to say. Uh, but really, um, thank you to everybody again. And I shall be hearing those words, I think, from your reading echoing, particularly the image of um, a dictator and his boots for some time in my head to come. So thank you very much. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>